Hello, Fellowship. I'm Adam McMahon. I am uh, one of the pastors that gets the opportunity uh, to serve here, and I get to be on the teaching team as well, which means I get, I get to have the opportunity every once in a while to be used by God uh, to dig into His Word. And today happens to be one of those days, and I get to do that with you this morning. So we're continuing in our series uh, titled The Upper Room uh, in the Gospel of John. And, uh, I love this series. I love that we're digging into these words, uh, what's happening with Jesus at this time. Now, let me ask you this question. What comes to mind when you hear this name? Benedict Arnold. I, I hear some chuckles. Some of you know. So you have that, that, that thought of traitor, of, of betrayal, right? I mean, what, what thoughts, what feelings do you have when you have, hear that name of Benedict Arnold? It's something like disgust, just filth. I mean, he's just the worst, right? He is terrible, a uniquely terrible, awful person. And yes, it's been nearly 240 years, and yet at the sound of his name, we still get this kind of bad taste in our mouth. Now, if you're sitting in here and you have no idea who I'm talking about, who Benedict Arnold is, now, you might not be from America. <laughs> and if so, we're welcome. We're glad you're here. Thank you for being here. But let me tell you, He's the most infamous traitor in American history. A man so hated that next to his birth record in the town that he was born, they marked traitor. A man so hated that people destroyed the gravestones of his entire family. Wow, right? Except for his mom. They left his mom alone, which is nice. <laughs> So hated that at West Point, where he commanded, and the hall where they have all of the commanders' names uh, throughout since West Point existed, there's simply his birth date and year that he commanded. There's, there's no name. They left him nameless. In fact, he's so hated that no less than Benjamin Franklin, perhaps you've heard of him, wrote this word, these words of him. Judas sold only one man. Arnold, three millions. That is, that's rough. I mean, he's saying he's worse than Judas. That's hatred. So let me tell you a little bit about him in case you happen to not know. He was born in America before America was a country. In fact, he became one of the better generals that America had during the American Revolution. He won more than his fair share of battles and something I didn't know until recently, he was actually friends with George Washington, the commander of all of the armies and our first president. So he's got all of this going for him, and yet at some point, he decides to turn on his country, start selling troop movements to the British. And not long after he sells these troop movements, uh, he becomes the commander of West Point, which was not a school at that time. It was actually a, a pretty important fort. It was, a fairly important place. So he comes up with this plan basically to sell West Point, to leave it completely defenseless so that the British can kind of just walk in and take it over, and then it's a lot harder for someone to take over a fort after someone else has already come. So he's got this plan, but he didn't come up, let's say he didn't count on the British head spy, John Andre was his name, getting arrested. <coughs> And he gets arrested with Arnold's plans in his boot. Which I always thought it's kind of a weird place to hide plans, but okay. Now, it gets crazier. He gets found out. And, and Arnold finds out what happens. He finds out that Andre's been captured at the same time that George Washington is actually going to his house for breakfast. So uh, he, Arnold finds this out, and he takes out of his house like a bat. Out of leaving a, a very hot place. <laughs> he hightails it to the British occupied New York and he managed to escape capture. Meanwhile, George Washington's at his house, at Arnold's house, and he finds out about this plot while he's there. I mean, can you imagine how Washington must have felt? I mean, how would you have felt had you been at this guy's house and found this out? I think angry might be a bit of an understatement. 
when he felt betrayed, not only by one of his generals, which is pretty terrible, but by a friend. And now get this, I mean, this was so bad that Washington, he offered to trade the chief of the British spies, John Andre, I mean, someone who definitely knew a lot about what would be going on and what was going on in the, in the British lines, and, uh, and he offers to trade him for Arnold. That's how much he wanted him. Now, when that didn't work, he sent like a black ops kind of group to capture or kill Arnold. I mean, that was rough. I imagine he didn't have a lot of good thoughts about Benedict Arnold. And uh, just to wrap the story up, Benedict Arnold ended up commanding British troops until the end of the war. He commanded British troops against sometimes his troops that he had had when he was an American general. And that's low. I mean, he was, all, by almost all accounts, universally disliked. I mean, everyone, even the British, didn't like him. Just a terrible guy. And a betrayer. Now, betrayal is it's rarely quite so remembered that we can remember that name 240 years later and still it draws to our mind who he is. But to the one betrayed, it hurts just as much. If you've been betrayed, you know what I'm talking about. You know how that hurts. And I think we've all dealt with betrayal in one way or another. Maybe you have a company that says they're going to replace your fence and, and they take down your old fence and then they say they're going to replace it and you pay them and then you never see them again. That company's betrayed you. Or take your work relationships. Your co-worker takes credit for the work that you've done and the boy totally throws you under the bus for something that they did poorly and you become the fall guy. Both of those have actually happened to me. Not at fellowship, not here, but I can tell you it did hurt. Or you find out the person that you thought was your friend was saying things about you that weren't true or, or telling things, people, things that you told them in confidence. There's a betrayal there. Or have you ever had been broken up with when you were dating someone and it totally took you by surprise? Oh, okay, just me. Uh, <laughs> I have. In fact, every girl I dated before my wife broke up with me, and I never saw it coming. <laughs> one time did I see this coming. It was rough. Uh, I got over it. You, you feel like the security of your relationship has been betrayed. Or your kids. Take your kids, for example. When they become teenagers... And some switch flips, right? The kid that you've taken care of your entire life all of a sudden turns on you and doesn't want you in their life at all. You feel betrayed by the ones that you cared for and loved for so long. And I know my time's coming. Mine are five and seven, but I know before long we'll be teenagers. But why? Why does betrayal hurt so much? Why did betrayal drive George Washington to send out basically a hit squad on Benedict Arnold? Why does it drive us to wish all sorts of awful things on betrayers? Well, here's why. The research actually tells us this. Research tells us you get hurt because when you've been betrayed, you feel that your betrayer doesn't value you, like as a person or as a friend. It's that lack of value that's so emotionally destructive. You feel that you have little to no value to that person that's betrayed you, and that is absolutely crushing. And as I think through my own experience, the experiences of those that I've counseled, and, and honestly what we see in this passage as well, that holds true. So the question that we're going to try to answer today is, how did Jesus deal with betrayal? How did Jesus deal with that pain? We'll see today how Jesus deals with betrayal of one of the people that were closest to him. And in John 13, 18 through 30, as Gary read, we'll see Jesus is dealing with betrayal, with a betrayer. And if you have a Bible and you haven't already turned to John 13, you have a chance to now, you can go for it. Uh, and let me give you a bit of context to set the scene for what's going on in, in this part of the Gospel of John. You see, this is right before Jesus is going to be arrested. And Jesus knows what's going to happen here. 
He gathers his disciples in this room, this upper room, so they can share a sacred meal together, the Passover meal. Think of it something kind of like sharing Thanksgiving with your closest friends, only honestly a lot more holy and sacred, but that's going to be the closest thing we can come to in America that would give you a bit of an idea. So he shares his last meal, he shares his last words with them, and he spends his last hours with the ones that he loves. But first, as Todd taught last week, he loves and he serves them by washing their just disgusting, nasty feet. And this week, we see Jesus deal with the harshest betrayal in this amazing way. In fact, if we didn't already know the story here, we would never expect him to deal with it like this. Even as he's dealing with this betrayal, we see this incredible thing. See, he calls his shot. Jesus calls the shot before it happens. He's speaking to the disciples, and he tells them what's about to happen. Do any of you remember the ads from the 90s that had Michael Jordan and Larry Bird playing horse? <laughs> Some people did. That's good. It's not just me. If you don't, go back and watch them on, on YouTube. They're actually really incredible. They're amazing. Really great ads. They've won all sorts of ads awards. Anyway, so Larry Bird, he challenges Michael Jordan to a game of horse, and, and what they do is they call out these increasingly complex shots. If you've ever played a horse, you've never played it like this. It ends with them. They're standing on top of the Sears Tower. Michael Jordan calls out, off the expressway, over the river, through the window, off the wall, nothing but net. It's amazing, right? And then as the ad fades to black, you hear the swish of the basketball. It's just, it's, this is an incredible shot to call. But I think Jesus' was even bigger. Right? Look at verse 18 with me here. And in verse 18 it says, But the scripture will be fulfilled. He who ate my bread has lifted his heel against me. So what he's doing here is he's quoting uh, Psalm 41. It's a psalm that was written over a thousand years before this time. Just to show exactly, a thousand years is kind of so big we don't even know. Remember Benedict Arnold 240 years ago. That seems like a long time. Times four, thousand years, written that long before, and he's showing them this is what's about to happen. I mean, that's impressive. That is a shot. Now that phrase, has lifted his heel against me, is pretty weird. It's kind of a weird thing to say. In Hebrew, it literally reads, has made his heel great against me. Which again, strange imagery, right? His heel, how does that get larger against somebody? Well, it's an idiom. It's, it's a reference, kind of like calling your shot, except that we don't know the original reference. We don't know what it's referring to. What we know is that it means something like this, like, has taken cruel advantage of me. It's take, talking about the betrayal of this intimate friend, a best friend. And he tells them how he's going to show them the betrayer by, by sharing his bread with him, which is exactly what's about to happen. And he's quoting this prophecy that was ha that told this a thousand years before. I mean, that is absolutely just amazing. And so Jesus, he tells his disciples this. But why? Why does Jesus call his shot to the disciples here? Well, he actually says it says why in verse 19. Look here. And it says, I am telling you this now before it takes place, that, you see that, look at that, that's so that, for the purpose, that when it does take place, you may believe that I am he. This is why Jesus tells the disciples, so that when it happens, they will believe. You see, Jesus, he's not just telling them to prove the point that he's in complete control, although it does prove that point. No one's going to take Jesus' life. He gives it freely. But Jesus knows that the disciples, they're about to go through these incredibly desperate times. They'll go through what might be the darkest time of their entire lives, their friend, their rabbi, their Messiah, the one they thought was going to rule over Israel soon. He's going to end up crucified in a couple days. And even though Jesus knows how terrible all of this is going to be, for him, his focus is actually on them. He's preparing them for what's about to happen. 
This is an incredibly loving and compassionate thing that Jesus is doing for them in the midst of what must have just been anguish for him, knowing what was going to happen. He loves them so much that he wants them to be able to continue to believe. So that even in the midst of seeing their friend and their leader tried and crucified, they'll be prepared. So then Jesus continues to prepare them. And in verse 20, he looks beyond the cross and beyond the resurrection to when he will commission them to be his witnesses, to share about him everywhere. And he says, truly, truly, I say to you. Now that's a way of saying, listen up, this is really important. Whoever receives the one I send you, you guys, the disciples, receives me. And whoever receives me receives the one who sent me. That's God. So he's saying, whoever accepts you accepts me and accepts God. So Jesus, he prophetically tells the disciples he's about to be betrayed and, and, and about how it's going to happen because he wants them to have the confidence to be able to believe. But notice something. Who is still here? Judas, the betrayer, he hasn't left yet. He's still in their midst as he's calling these shots. He's still there listening. And now Jesus, even more intentionally, begins to love the betrayer even more so. Jesus loves the betrayer. Jesus has loved the betrayer throughout Judas' time with him. Just think about this with me. I mean, Jesus, he had known Judas would betray him. From eternity past, before Judas was even a thought, he knew this was the man that would betray him. And yet Jesus, he still called him to be one of his disciples. Jesus walked with him. He lived with him and taught him just like all the other disciples. For the last three years, he's been doing this. And Judas was there when Jesus fed the 5,000, fed the 3,000, when he calmed the storm, when he healed people, when he brought Lazarus back from the dead. They ate together. They were incredibly close. And do you think George Washington would have treated Benedict Arnold this way? Had he known Arnold was going to betray him? No, I don't think he would have. I don't think he would have been going to his house on that morning. Would you have treated the person who betrayed you differently had you known that? Of course you would have treated him differently. You would have at least put up some boundaries to keep from getting hurt so much. We all would have done that. But Jesus didn't seem to. Just a few minutes before this part of the story, Jesus, he's washing all of the disciples' feet. And he didn't exclude Judas. Even though he knew Judas was about to betray him, he washed his feet. Now let's look at how Jesus loves him even now. Look at verse 21 with me. And in verse 21 he says, there it says, after saying these things, Jesus was troubled in his spirit and testified, truly, truly, I say to you. Again, he's saying, listen up, this is really important. One of you will betray me. And the disciples, they looked at one another, uncertain of whom he spoke. So Jesus, he says that one of the twelve will betray him, as plainly as he has ever said anything. And all the disciples, they're stunned. They're in shock, silence. They're just looking at one another, wondering what's happening. So some friends of ours, they have this six-year-old who just started kindergarten this year, right? And before I go any further, I have to say that they gave me permission to share the story. So none of you get worried if you're my friends and you're like, I don't know when he's going to share my story. They gave me permission. So you know. So they're sweet quiet angel of a six-year-old. He's riding, to, to, not to school, to, in the car with his mom to church one Sunday, right? And they're riding to school to church, and, and he asked this question just as clear as you can, can hear me now. He says this, Mom, is the F word a bad word? <laughs> Only he doesn't say the F word. <laughs> he said the word. Imagine the stunned silence in that car. Yeah. The mom even tries not to wreck as she picks her jaw up off the floor. Just, just utter shock and silence, right? Her silence is something like what happened in that upper room as Jesus spoke these words. That's what it would have been like. The disciples couldn't believe what they just heard, and they just looked around at one another going, 
who, who, who's he talking about? They're all shocked. And it's not so much that Peter, Peter, the one who is so unafraid to stick his foot in his mouth, he's done it over and over again. He won't even ask Jesus directly what they all want to know. Instead, he goes through John. That's who the one who Jesus loved is. He's, and he's sitting, well, he's not sitting, he's reclining right next to Jesus. And John, he leans into Jesus, and he quietly asks him in verse 25, Lord, who is it? Jesus answers, and he kind of says this kind of cryptically. It is he to whom I will give this morsel of bread when I have dipped it. I'm going to be honest. Sometimes I just wish he would have said, it's Judas. Judas is scared it's going to betray me, guys. He's the one. But he doesn't say that. Instead, he says, it's the person that I'm going to give this piece of bread to. So then Jesus dips the bread and he gives it to Judas. And he does this in front of all of the disciples. So you might be asking the question, how is this loving Judas? Hey, good question. I'm glad you asked. Let me answer. And to understand, I've got to explain a couple things first. So a couple things. First, for Jesus to have handed this piece of bread over to him, Judas would have been sitting right next to him. And so pretty much all of the commentators agree because of the way that it says that John, or the one whom Jesus loved, was reclining on him. All the commentators agree that John was on Jesus' right side so that he would be able to whisper to him and, and ask that question, which leaves the left side for, Ju for Judas, which at, at a dinner like Passover or any dinner like that, it was the place of highest honor. Out of all of the guests, Judas was the one on his left side. So Jesus, he had Judas sit in this place of more honor than any of the other 12 that are sitting around the table. I mean, it'd be like getting to sit at the head of the, head of the table at Thanksgiving, only a lot more so in their culture. And then second, the whole deal about dipping the morsel of bread, it wasn't just some random thing that Jesus decided to do to be unique or different. No, it actually had, had incredible meaning in their culture. So in their culture, the host at a feast, which would be Jesus in this case, they would begin the meal by dipping a piece of bread or meat into a common, like they had a common bowl, and they'd give it to one of the guests as a mark of friendship or a mark of honor. It'd be like being asked to carve the turkey in front of everyone at Thanksgiving, only again, a whole lot more so. It was much more of an honor than that. So this is what Judas, he's experiencing this right now. This man that you followed for the last three years of your life, this man, he's invited you to the upper room, he's washed your feet, then he's placed you next to him at, his, at this holy meal, in the place of highest honor, and then he gives you the piece of bread that marks you as one of his closest friends, in front of the 12 other men that, that you know are just as close to him. You've seen them. You've experienced them for the last 12 or the last three uh, years. I mean, it was such a huge thing that one commentator wrote that, that this was a final gesture of supreme love. This was a final gesture of supreme love toward Judas. You see that Jesus, he's giving Judas one final opportunity to repent, to turn his back on Satan. To turn to Jesus, the one who is directly and then right in front of him, loving and serving him. Sometimes I wonder what must have been in Jesus' eyes as he looked at Judas to give him that morsel of bread. What did Judas see? Was there hope there mixed with the sadness that troubled him? Was Jesus peaceful? How must Jesus' face have changed after Judas took the morsel from him? When Judas finally, completely, and totally rejected him. When Judas showed Jesus that Jesus had no value to him at all. When he showed Jesus that he didn't care at all for him. The sadness and yet acceptance that must have spread across Jesus' face must have been palpable. Jesus' next words after Satan completely enters Judas is this. What you're going to do, do quickly. You see, Jesus is saying, he's saying, don't drag this out. It has to happen. Make it quick. 
So Jesus loved Judas all the way to the end. And Judas rejects that love and turns to Satan instead to just let Satan use him. He chooses to betray the love of Jesus to his face. Then Judas makes a break for it. Judas runs. The betrayer, he runs. Our oldest son, Caleb, his best friend lives right next door to him. And next door to us. That's how that works. He lives with us. Which is incredible for so many reasons. Not the least of which is we don't have to drive for him to get to hang out with his friend. Which is very convenient for us. But there is one issue that comes up when your seven-year-old's best friend's house is close enough to walk to. Yeah, he disappears a lot. All of a sudden, he'll just be gone. Now, we've told him constantly, you can't just go run next door. You need to talk to us. You need to ask us. But even just last week, we're pulling up to the driveway, and, and he asks us, and because Caleb, he saw his best friend next door. He saw that their car was there, and he asks us. But by the time we had pulled the car to a complete stop, unbuckled, unbuckled his little brother from the car seat, he was gone. He had disappeared. We were like, where did he go? We were left kind of scratching our heads going, where, and how did he get there so quick? Where did he, how, did he, how did he move that quick? And of course, we found out he had gone next door, and he had gone next door incredibly quick. And I, I think that's something like what happened in this room. That's something like what happened in the upper room as Jesus said, do what you're doing quickly. I mean, look at verse 30. Verse 30 says, so after receiving the morsel of bread, he immediately left. He immediately went out. I mean, he fled like a bat out of a very hot place. Or like Benedict Arnold out of his home when he was, his plan was discovered. Judas leaves the room so quickly that his disciples, they're just left wondering, that the disciples are left wondering what happened. I mean, that's what verse 28 and 29 are are saying, it's just John saying, hey, parenthetically, no one knew what was going on with Judas, or why Jesus told him to leave so quickly. It's kind of this, by the way, we thought he was going to go give money to the poor, or go buy some food. By the way, I mean, this is amazing. This, this just shows how well Judas had lied to all of them. This shows how well Judas had covered this up. I mean, they really thought he was one of them. They thought he followed Jesus, too. But I do have to tell you guys, this, this lack of action and ignorance has always kind of bothered me. I mean, how is it that these 11 men just heard what Jesus said and saw what Jesus did, and they didn't know what, that Judas was, a, was the betrayer, that Judas was going to do what he did? And so a lot of scholars have tried to explain this. They said that the room, they must have been incredibly loud, and so they couldn't have all heard, Right? But there's only 13 of them total in the room. And they all heard Jesus say, one of you will betray me. Remember they all got really quiet when they heard this and they looked around at each other? I mean, surely they were watching out for what Jesus did next after this and what he said next after that. I mean, at least John, he heard for sure, right? I mean, because he was talking to John. The only explanation that makes any sense to me is simply that Judas, he moved so quickly to get out of there, that by the time they began to think about it, he was already gone. I think that, and I believe God, he must have paused their thoughts to some extent, just to keep them from recognizing what they saw until after it happened. Because it had to happen. This had to happen, and, and so God must have paused that thought. What's clear here, though, is that this terrible betrayer gave in to Satan. I mean, Satan. That's Satan. I mean, and then he runs from the room to go betray Jesus. In the last words of verse 30, they just they leave us stunned. Look at them with me, and it, and it says, and it was night. Yeah, it was night when they had dinner, but this is so much more significant than just a time of day. You see, there's a spiritual reality that John, he's pointing to here. The darkness that Jesus has been pointing to and going to these last three years has now arrived, and it's going to stay dark, even though the sun will rise until the resurrection dawns after Christ is crucified. And this is a sad state of affairs for them, for Jesus and what's left 
of his disciples. And yet, this is all known by Jesus. He's not surprised by Judas's betrayal. This is a part of the sovereign work of God. And that's not to say it doesn't sadden him, but it didn't shock him either. Jesus chose to give his life. It was not taken from him. And even though it's now night, Jesus goes on to say some incredible things to these disciples. He makes the most of the time that's left for them and for us. And we'll, and we'll see this next week, and as we continue in our series, all that he speaks to them, and all that he prays for them, and prays for us. And it's really amazing to see. So Jesus, he called the shot, showing everyone that he was in control. Then he sowed, he showed such complete and utter love for the betrayer, and yet, despite what Jesus did for him, Judas chose to betray, and he ran out of the room and ran. So what do we do with this, right? What do we, this, this is a nice story. What do we do? Of course, the simple answer would be don't be like Judas, right? I mean, don't be like Judas, which, of course, we shouldn't be. That seems clear. But none of us identify with Judas anyway, right? I mean, he's in a class all by himself. Maybe you can put, you know, Benedict Arnold up there with Judas. But those two guys and then the rest of us are over here. None of us would ever betray him. I mean, we're the injured party. We're, we're the one that's been betrayed here. But get that, that's not what the Bible says. And Romans 5.10 says that while we were God's enemies, we were reconciled to him. When we had betrayed Jesus, he reconciled himself to us. So here's the point and the point of the passage. The point, Jesus' love extends all the way to those who betray. Jesus' love extends all the way to those who betray. And I know that rhymes, and I thought myself very clever about that. I just want to say that. Every once in a while, preachers, they find something that rhymes, and we have to keep it in. And well, hey, maybe it'll help you remember this. But Jesus' love, it does extend to those who betray him. The question I have for you today is, does yours? Does your love extend to that coworker? That friend, that family member, that person in church who betrayed you. There are two points here that I have to make. First, you've betrayed someone too. You have betrayed Christ. Recognize that. Accept that. You have valued something, maybe lots of things, more than you value Christ. You are no better than Judas or Benedict Arnold. And before you get too mad at me... I'm not any better either. Yet, and secondly, despite that, you are loved. God loves you to the utmost with this infinite love. And how do I know that he does? I mean, he sent his son to die for you, despite what you've done to him. And if you're a Christian in here, you've been forgiven. You have been washed clean. You have been adopted by God and indwelled by the Holy Spirit. Despite what we've done. Tim Keller's quote on the gospel gets it so right because he clarifies the points so well. The gospel is this. We are more sinful and flawed in ourselves than we ever dared believe. Yet at the same time, we are more loved and accepted in Jesus Christ than we ever dared hope. We are more sinful than we even want to think of. And yet we are more loved and accepted in Jesus than we thought possible. Now I do have to say, if you're in here and you're in the seat of the one who's been betrayed, if you feel undervalued, if you feel so completely worthless, know this, you are immensely, cosmically, completely valuable. You are valuable to God. You are valuable to him even as you've acted as though he has no value to you. He loved you, found you valuable enough to send his own son. Now, the only way that we're going to be able to love even those that betray us is to stop putting them in this separate class of person from ourselves and instead to recognize that we have betrayed even the one that we say we value more than any other. 
The one who knows us intimately and loves us infinitely, who has blessed us with every blessing in the heavenly places, he's the one that we've all betrayed. And if we want unity, we have to stop believing that they're the evil betrayers and I'm good. You see, we all need the cross. Now, it's not easy. It's impossible. But Christ, but Christ empowers us to do the impossible. So what's the next step? And on your handout, on the online notes, and on the bulletin and the connection card, we have them lots of places. You'll see four steps, specific ways that you can apply this, that you can apply the word of God. First, share. Find someone or some people to talk through the discussion questions uh, with. They're in the notes and uh, they're online on the online notes as well. Talk to your small group or your family, or your life transformation group, and discuss these questions with them. Second, study. Review the passage. And review what the passage says about, one, who God is, and then secondly, who you are in light of God's work. Go back through the passage this week sometime, make notes on what it says, and who God is. And then look at who you are in light of God's work in this particular passage. I think you'll be amazed. I go through this. I, I go through those questions every time I study God's word, and I'm always amazed by what they uh, picture and, and how I can see them. Third, pray. Thank God that He loved you through all the ways that you've betrayed Him and forgiven you through Jesus' work. Take some time this afternoon or tonight before you go to bed and think through the ways that you've betrayed Jesus. Think through the ways that you've chosen things or people over him. And for each one of those, thank him for his forgiveness. Thank him that he loved you through that. And then finally, and maybe the most difficult, practice. Take one step this week in faith to receive healing from betrayal. If you felt the sting of betrayal, and you felt like someone didn't value you or your relationship with them. And, and let's face it, we've all felt that at some point. And you, if you felt that way, take a step this week toward healing. And yes, that's intentionally vague because that step can mean a lot of different things. Here's four different ways that it could mean. It, it could mean that you need to reach out to the person to seek to reconcile with them. If they're truly repentant. I mean, it could mean that you just need to begin to wish that person well. You need to stop wishing bad things to happen to them. But honestly, that could be too much for you right now. Perhaps you could just begin to pray for that person. A prayer or something like, Lord, draw near to him. Would he feel your presence? Or perhaps you need to talk to someone. Someone that can help you journey through healing. And I'm a big proponent of this. I am a very big proponent of this, a good Christian counselor can help you work through that pain incredibly well. Believe me, I know I'm married to one. They can help a ton. If you'd like to talk to a counselor about that, talk to me. I can recommend others as well. And I want to tell you this because I, I went to a, a group counseling, like a group that is now counseling that's new to the area this week. If money is an issue for you, I want to offer you something. We, have the, we got these cards from them. They're really incredible. And they're $100 cards. They will give you the first session for free. If you want counseling, money's been an issue, this is a great opportunity to see a really incredible Christian counselor. I only was given 10. And so if you need it, these are here for you to help you. That's how important we believe this is. But I can tell you, whatever step you take, Take it in faith, trusting God this week. So there's four ways to respond. Share, study, pray, practice. If you would, check them off on the care card. Put them in the boxes in the foyer with your name on it. And we'll pray for you this week as staff. We would love to get to pray with you as you take these steps. So Jesus' love extends all the way to those who betray 
We saw Jesus' love for his disciples and his love for the betrayer even. Is that betrayer, though, rejected that love? And his love extends even to us. May our love extend out to those that betray as well. And as we extend our love, as we get healing from betrayal, as we take steps towards others, we'll bring unity to the church and to our community as well through the power of Christ. Will you pray with me along those ends? Oh, and I want to say as I pray, I'm going to ask the prayer team to come up. They and I would love to talk with you and pray with you about anything at all. We'll stick around after a bit, uh, a bit here after the service, and I have those cards with me, so uh, feel free to come up and talk with me. Anyway, will you pray with me now? Father God, we thank you that you forgive us what feels like an infinite amount of times, and it feels, Father, like we need everyone. We confess that we've betrayed you. We've chosen things above you, things that don't matter compared to you. We thank you for sending your son to live and to die on the cross to reconcile to us and the world to you. We pray that we would bring unity to our church as we look to you as a broken, yet loved and adopted people, as sons and daughters. Lord, we need you. Every hour, we need you. Every minute, we need you. You forgive us. We believe in the power of the gospel. We believe that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. on that, we will be transformed. May we continue to focus on his great love for us and your great love for us as you sent him to die on the cross, to live the life that we can't live, that we didn't live, to die the death that we deserved, that we would have new life again. Thank you for the power of the resurrection. We thank you that we can sit in the light, because he is in the light. In your son's name we pray, by the Spirit. Amen. Now let me leave you with this before you leave. God's love shows through how Jesus treated even the worst of people, even the one who betrayed him, even those like us. Now may we go out this week and extend love in the same way as Christ, empowered by Christ, to love like him. Thank you. We'll see you next week. Come on up. We'd love to talk with you.